Hello, everyone. This is an introduction to group cohomology, in particular to Galois cohomology. It's an extra lecture, part of my uh, graduate course on elliptic curves. So most of the applications here are to Galois cohomology and to uh, exact sequences coming from uh, the arithmetic of elliptic curves. But uh, if you've never seen group cohomology, this might help. Uh, if you are seeing group cohomology in other settings, like uh, local class field theory or something, uh, this might help. Um, the goal here is just to define H naught and H1, the first two cohomology groups, because those are the ones that come up um, in, uh, in what we it's going to follow in our course on elliptic curves. But uh, the the definition for H2 and so on are uh, are similar, and the reason behind it is similar. So we're going to try to motivate why we define these cohomology groups, and then try to um, define them, and then also do some examples and uh, and um, improve uh, the isomorphism type of some of these uh, cohomology groups. Okay, so get start. Let's get started. Here, G is a finite group, and M is an abelian group on which G acts. So M has an action of G, uh, which makes um, uh, makes M into a G module. Okay, and uh, we will we will write the action of G. So for uh, some sigma in G, we write the action uh, sometimes just as uh, sigma times M, which would be sigma acting on M. Sometimes like in Silverman's book, um, the action is denoted by a sigma as an exponent there. Um, all right, uh, by the way, this is uh, based mostly on the appendix that appears in uh, Silverman's The Arithmetic of Elliptic Curves, but there are many other uh, options for introductions to cohomology. All right, um, <clears throat> we might also, we will also talk about uh, infinite groups when G is a profinite group. Um, so uh, note that we will also upgrade this to profinite groups. Um, um, so sometimes G is going to be a profinite uh, group because we're, we want uh, to also use absolute Galois groups. Um, and for those, uh, we're going to need to use some topology. We're going to have to talk about maps from G to M. And for those, we want those maps to be continuous. So uh, if G is a profinite group, um, there is a profinite uh, topology. And uh, we, were, we will require that the action of the uh, the action of G on M is continuous with respect to that uh, topology. So we require uh, the action of G on M uh, to be continuous uh, with respect to uh, uh, the profinite topology, the profinite topology on G and the discrete topology on M. And the uh, discrete uh, topology on M. Okay. And uh, whenever there are maps, uh, if G is actually a profinite group, all the maps are going to be assumed con uh, to be continuous. So I'll, I'll remark on those. Okay. So let's uh, let's start with some examples of uh, of Galois modules or modules. Uh, with an action. Uh, so, for example, uh, let's switch to this color. And uh, for example, uh, G, uh, the Galois group of the complex numbers over the reals, acts on, uh, well, on the uh, complex numbers, acts on the uh, the non-zero complex numbers. Uh, this is, by the way, just uh, there are two elements: uh, the identity uh, automorphism or uh, complex conjugation. So there's only two elements that sends a complex number to its conjugation uh, to its conjugate, and it, it also acts, but trivially, on uh, on the reals or on the um, 
the non-zero reals. Okay. Uh, more generally, uh, more generally, uh, if L over K is a, a finite Galois extension of uh, fields, then um, then G, the Galois group of L over K, acts on on L on L cross. It also uh, if 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 um, let's say number fields, then um, or local fields. It also acts on the ring of integers. So it also acts on the ring of integers of L. It also acts on the units of the ring of integers of L, uh, etc. Uh, here's another example, a little bit more concrete. Um, uh, now for a uh, an infinite Galois extension, so take an algebraic closure of your field K, and um, remember uh, the notation mu M is going to be the mth root of unity, mth, the group of mth uh, roots of unity in uh, K bar cross, um, then the absolute Galois group of K bar over K acts on, um, on mu M and that action is continuous. And um, that is an example of such action. By the way, notice that, um, note here that the you can pick the algebraic closure of the reals to be the complex numbers. So uh, that is an example. Uh, so here the Galois group of R bar over R uh, can be like in the very first example, the Galois group of the complex over the reals. Okay, so that's an example of that. Great. Um, how about in, in the world of elliptic curves? We've seen other modules where the Galois group acts. So, for example, uh, the uh, again with an algebraic closure of your field K, if you have an elliptic curve over K, uh, then we've defined the n torsion to be those points defined over the algebraic closure such that. Uh, n times p is the identity in the group law of the uh, of the elliptic curve, and uh, this carries an action of the Galois group because the addition is defined as a morphism defined over k. So uh, the Galois group acts on um, on the n torsion. Okay, and uh, we've seen that also. Um, you can extend this. So, for example, I can uh, I can extend the actions in the first and the in the last two uh, points. For example, to extend the action of the absolute Galois group acts on uh, what we called uh, T mu of K, which is the inverse limit of the uh, roots of unity over um, over power maps, those um, uh, that's called the it's the Tate module of K, and similarly, um, you can um, act on uh, the Tate module of an elliptic curve, which would be the inverse limit of uh, En, and um also if you want just one piadic tate module you can uh, do the inverse limit over um the p to the n torsion subgroups and then you get the piadic tate module and it acts on that so you could uh, take any of these examples to be the group and the module uh, that we're going to be talking about okay all right very good so um so again let's assume that uh, if that M is a G module, like before, 
um, then uh, this action satisfies well the basic properties of of being a G module that uh, the identity. So if E is the identity in G, the identity, then uh, the action of the identity on any M has to be trivial. Uh, the action of uh, sigma on uh, sum is the sum of the actions. And um, the action of uh, the action is associative in that I can, uh, if I act by sigma times tau, where sigma and tau are in G, that is the same that sigma acting on tau acting on M. So tau acts first. So note here, I'm going to make a note. Uh, that my modules uh, here, I'm talking about left uh, modules. So this is a, a left uh, modules. So the action is on the left, but in some uh, some books on uh, on this, for example, in Silverman's appendix, the action is on the right. I find that a little bit confusing. So I usually just uh, write my actions on the left. So, but you have to be careful if you're translating one and the other. Okay, and then uh, we say that a G module homomorphism uh, between uh, G modules uh, M and N is a map from uh, phi from M to N such that it's a home and is a because M and N are abelian groups, so it is a home of um, of abelian groups. Plus, the action has to behave well with respect to the map. So uh, the action commutes with the homomorphism. So sigma acting on phi of M is the same as phi acting on sigma or phi of sigma acting on M for all uh, M in M and sigma in G, okay? So that is um, a G module homomorphism and the properties of being a module. Great. So uh, here's one, um, one submodule of interest uh, so you can define similarly uh, G submodules. So we have uh, some submodule of M, um, but in, of particular interest is the largest submodule of M where G acts trivially, and that we call M G, and that is uh, the largest submodule of M. Uh, where uh, G acts trivially, um, which is by definition, this is the M's in M such that the action is trivial uh, for all sigma in G. Um, why is this of particular interest? For example, on uh, in the world of elliptic curves, if I have an elliptic curve uh, over Q, say, and my G here is the Galois group of uh, of Q bar over Q, uh, then uh, if I take, for example, the N torsion, the N torsion is a G module, and uh, the largest submodule of EN that is fixed by Galois, the Galois group of Q bar over Q, by the properties of a Galois theory are those points of order N that are defined over Q. So this is the points defined over Q. This is, uh, this is really E Q bar N is all the N torsion points, but the um, the invariants under the Galois group are precisely those points of order and that are defined over Q. 
And that is something we want to get our hands on. What rational points are there on an elliptic curve that are defined over Q? So for example, what portion points are there for the undefined over Q? So that is uh, uh, the module we're interested in. Okay, so for example, uh, let me give some other examples here of this group, of this module. Uh, if G is the Galois group of L over K, then by the properties of Galois theory, uh, the fixed field by G, uh, the fixed field is a sub-extension of L and in F4, by the property of the Galois theory, that is the base field K. Similarly, uh, the, the fixed field of, or the fixed submodule of the ring of integers is the ring of integers of K. Okay. Um, if you take, for example, what are the, the nth roots of unity in L and you uh, try to fix, see what's fixed by Galois, those are going to be the nth the nth roots of unity that are defined over k. Okay. Um, great. So now um, uh, we're going to pose a, a natural question. Now suppose I have a exact sequence of Galois modules and I take this invariance and then let's see if that exact sequence is preserved uh, under taking this uh, invariance of um, of the group. So let uh, P, M, and N be uh, G modules. Okay. And uh, suppose that zero going to P, going to M, going to N, going to zero, this map is going to be alpha and beta. Uh, suppose that this is, and uh, let uh, this be an exact sequence of G modules. So it's an exact sequence of abelian groups and alpha and beta, those are um, mod G module uh, homomorphisms in addition. Okay. Um, so um, remember that there are uh, several properties that this is, for this to be exact, it has to be exact at every point. Uh, exactness here means that um, that this map is injective. Okay, so there are the what this says is that um, so first, as I said, alpha and beta are G module homomorphisms. Uh, we have that alpha is injective. Uh, the exactness at this point means that beta is surjective. And the exactness in the middle, what it means is that the image equals the kernel, okay, which is what happens at every point. But if you translate that in the left and the right, it says injective, subjective. In the middle, what it says is that the image of alpha is the kernel of beta. Okay, um, so now let's try to apply uh, G invariance and see what we get. So now and apply uh, G invariance and see what we get. Well, we have now um, the part of the submodule of P that uh, where G acts trivially, the submodule of M where G acts trivially, and the submodule of N where G acts trivially. And uh, since PG is a submodule of P, I can use alpha, but just restricted uh, to, uh, to PG uh, that I get a map. And I also get a map from MG to NG for the same reasons. It's beta, but just restricted to MG. Okay, uh, so I get those those maps where alpha prime is uh, alpha restricted to PG, and uh, beta prime is beta uh, restricted to MG. Okay, so the question now is: This is still an exact sequence. 
still exact? Uh, do I um, do I keep my exactness? Uh, so uh, let's check. So first, uh, is alpha prime injective? Um, so uh, alpha prime is injective. Uh, well, alpha is injective. Is an injective homomorphism. So alpha prime uh, would have, if anything, a smaller kernel, but the kernel is already trivial. So, um, and alpha prime is just a restriction. Um, therefore, it's also injective. Okay. So uh, we have exactness on the uh, left. So I'm going to add the exactness here. Okay, so we do have that. Um, how about now, um, um, what else? Um, we are going to need to see if there is exactness in the middle. So is is this is the image? So exactness in the middle would mean that the image of alpha prime is the kernel of beta prime, and that is not uh, so clear anymore. But um, let's see. So again, I have um, so far what I have is that PG goes through alpha prime injectively into mg and then i have beta prime going into ng okay and now right now i'm checking exactness right there so i'm checking i'm asking is the image of alpha prime equal to the kernel of beta prime where we know that alpha and beta uh, there was this exactness there okay so um, first of all, note uh, that the kernel of um, beta prime, um, because uh, beta prime is just a restriction to a submodule, a restriction of beta to a submodule, that will be uh, the kernel of beta uh, intersect uh, the invariant subgroup of M. Okay. Um, also, uh, note that uh, I'm going to uh, prove that the image, a similar, uh, a similar equation, but for the image of alpha prime. So I claim that the image of alpha prime is the image of alpha intersect invariance. Okay. That is not so clear. Uh, so let me let me prove this. Well, the, the fact that the image of alpha prime is contained in the image of alpha uh, intersect mg, that is clear because um, the image of alpha prime, uh, well, we had um, it's certainly inside the image of alpha, and because it's elements that are in P, they're invariant under G, then they are invariant in M under G. Okay, so that is clear. Um, but uh, so for the other inclusion, um, let's see. Uh, for the other inclusion, the problem is that there might be something that's coming from, um, is there something that is in the image of alpha? Um, um, yeah, so can, can have, can we have something? Um, so let, let's start with something that is in the image of alpha intersect mg. So um, suppose um, that m is in the image of alpha intersect mg. And therefore, uh, well, it's in the image of alpha. Uh, I have to prove that it's in the image of alpha prime. Uh, but it could possibly come from something in P that is not invariant under G. So let's prove that that whatever that is has to be invariant under G. So uh, so there is a P in P such that alpha of P is M. Okay. 
Um, and therefore, uh, if I apply um, and now let sigma be in G arbitrary, uh, let's see what happens if I apply sigma to alpha P. Uh, that on the one hand will be the same as applying sigma on M, but M is in MG, so this is M. This is because M is invariant under, um, under G, that we know for M. We don't know it yet for P, okay? And on the other hand, um, we, we can, um, because alpha is a G module homomorphism, this is the same that sigma uh, of, or uh, yeah, sigma of, or alpha of sigma of P, okay? Um, and that tells me that this is also M, okay? But then I have uh, that alpha sends sigma of P to M and alpha sends P to M by definition, um, plus alpha is injective, that implies then uh, that P must be sigma of P. And since sigma was arbitrary, P is in the invariant subgroup, in the invariant submodule. It's in P and invariant under G. Okay. Uh, so uh, what that proves is that M is actually in the image of alpha prime. Okay. Because alpha prime sends the invariance of P into the invariance of M. Great. So uh, what does that show? Uh, that shows that um, um, so what, what that's going to show now, what, what we, want, we do want to show is this. So now notice that then since the image of alpha is the kernel of beta, then this implies that the image of alpha uh, intersect mg has to be equal to the um, kernel of beta intersect mg, but we just proved that uh, this piece here is uh, the image of alpha prime, uh, while this piece here is the kernel of beta prime. Uh, and that is what we wanted to prove for the exactness uh, here, okay? So uh, it is also exact there. However, it is not always exact on the right, okay? So uh, however, so warning. Um, the, the sequence that goes from, um, what did we have? We had zero. Zeros, zero going to PG, going to MG, going to NG is not necessarily, is not necessarily any longer uh, exact on the right. Uh, so what we call beta prime, uh, beta prime is not uh, necessarily uh, surjective. Uh, let's see an example. So here's an example of this is that I can take, uh, for example, this exact sequence, uh, one goes to plus minus one, goes to uh, the complex, goes to the complex under um, the squaring and uh, that goes to one. So the the important map here is a squaring of complex numbers. The kernel of that map is just plus or minus one. The only number complex numbers whose square is trivial, whose square is one, and they're plus or minus one. And because the complex numbers are algebraically closed, the squaring is surjective. So this is an exact sequence. Okay. Uh, so this is an exact sequence of Galois modules. It is an exact sequence of Galois uh, modules. 
okay? Um, so I can take, um, I'm gonna call this uh, G and take invariance. So take invariance, so taking G, G invariance, what happens to this exact sequence? I get, uh, well, uh, plus or minus one are reals, so that is uh, a stable already. So that is the largest subgroup that is stable. Uh, the invariance of C cross is R cross. Uh, we get the same map, but now over the reals, that is the restriction of beta. And uh, this goes to the invariance of C cross, which is R cross. But now we see that this is not, um, uh, this is not, uh, not surjective because um, this map is not surjective. Not every real number is a square of a real number. Only the positive real numbers are squares of real numbers, right? So what I would like to know is um, instead of those negative news, I would like to fix this exact sequence. Uh, so here now the, the goal is uh, to fix uh, the short exact sequences, uh, short uh, G sequences. And how do we want to fix that? I want to put something else in here, okay? Um, that is going to make this exact. Okay, so this is the goal, is to find something there that is going to make this exact. And that's what cohomology is going to do for us. Um, so it's going to define a group uh, G module that is going to fit in there and make this exact. The problem is that we're not going to find one, we're going to find a, a sequence of uh, cohomology groups that we have to put in there for this to be exact. Um, but at least we are going to find uh, one that is going to fit in this space right there. All right, so uh, if you try to do this, if you try exactly this for any Galois sequence to find what G module you need in there for this to be exact, you would come up uh, yourself with the idea of cohomology. So let me, uh, let me tell you then what are the definitions that, um, that take place to make that exact. Okay, so here is the definition of cohomology that will make those exact those those sequences exact. So let M be a G module. And um, so first of all, uh, we define the zeroth cohomology group is H naught of GM. The zeroth cohomology is precisely the G invariance of M, which, as we said before, is just the elements of M such that the action of G is trivial. Okay, now to define H1, I'm going to need uh, a little bit of uh, construction here. It's going to be a quotient. So here we go. So first, uh, define the group of one cochains is uh, the group C1 of GM is simply uh, maps. Um, maps that are going from G to M. Not group homomorphisms, this is just maps, okay? Uh, however, if G is profinite, there is one more uh, requirement. If G is profinite, then we require those maps to be continuous. Okay, and that means continuous with respect to the profinite topology of G and the discrete topology of M. Okay. Uh, all right, so that's just cochains, it's just maps from G to M. Now, uh, how about the group of uh, one cocycles? 
one cos cycles are going to be now homomorphisms, almost homomorphisms, which is what we, are, we call twisted homomorphisms. So these are uh, denoted by Z1 of GM, and these are uh, co-chains, uh, such that in addition, uh, we have this twisted homomorphism uh, structure. So uh, sigma tau, uh, if I, if, if it was a home, it would just be phi of sigma times phi of tau. Um, but here what happens is that this is phi of sigma plus sigma acting on phi of tau. It's sort of like a, a chain rule kind of thing, okay, for all sigma and tau in G. And as I said, uh, these are called sometimes uh, twisted uh, homes. Okay. Um, by the way, if the module here, the module, I'm always taking it to be sort of like additive module. Uh, if it is multiplicative, this would be not just a plus, but it's uh, a, a, a dot, right? So if we were talking about units in the complex numbers, for example, or roots of unity, we might want to use uh, times instead of a plus. Uh, but anyway, that comes with uh, with the context. And now, uh, last, uh, we define the group of one co-boundaries. And the group of one co-boundaries is going to be, we're going to prove in a moment, that is a subgroup of co-cycles. Um, there is one easy way to construct co-cycles, which is this sort of like, quote unquote, dumb way of doing it, which is the following. The, the co-boundaries are, uh, in principle, just co-chains. We'll, we'll show that these are co-cycles, uh, given by, uh, such that there is a fixed M in M, that's important, such that phi of sigma is just uh, sigma of M minus M for all sigma in G. Okay, so there is one M such that every value is uh, sigma of M minus M. Okay, uh, so as I said, let's prove that uh, the co-boundaries are in fact a subgroup of the co-cycles. So um, I just need to prove to you that a co-boundary is actually a co-cycle. Uh, so let um, M be in M and phi a map from G to M, which is a co-boundary. So uh, phi of sigma is always sigma of M minus M, okay? And um, then uh, what happens if sigma and tau are in G? Uh, I want to show that it satisfied the twisted homomorphism property. So phi of sigma tau, uh, what would that be? That would be sigma tau acting on M minus M by definition. And what I'm going to do is add and subtract sigma of M here, uh, sigma tau of M minus sigma of M plus sigma of M uh, minus M. This is sigma acting on tau of M minus M plus sigma of M minus M. And this is, well, I'm going to reorder these, but sigma of M minus M is phi acting, phi, the image of phi, so the image of sigma under phi. So this is phi of sigma plus sigma acting on the image of tau. Okay, this here is uh, this, and this tau minus M is phi of tau, and then sigma is acting on phi of tau. Okay, so you see that it satisfies the condition. It satisfies the twisted uh, condition. It's satisfied there. Great. So um, these are uh, the boundaries. The co-boundaries are a subgroup of the 
um, cool cycles. And therefore, we can do a quotient, and that is by definition the, um, the quotient of the two is what we call uh, um, uh, the, the first cohomology group. So, um, by definition, the first cohomology group was so remember that the zeroth cohomology group was simply the G invariance, and the first cohomology group is the uh, one co-cycles modulo uh, co-boundaries. These are abelian groups, so we can do a quotient, uh, and, um, and there we have it. Great. So uh, here are some remarks about these groups. Uh, we similarly define H2, H3, and so on. Uh, they just the definitions of the two code cycles and two co boundaries are more complicated. So I'm not going to get there. Uh, you can pick up a, a book on cohomology and see all those definitions yourself. But uh, here's uh, a few remarks. So if G acts trivially on M, which does happen many times, G acts. Uh, trivially on M, then what happens? Uh, well, first, uh, we have that uh, the invariance is all of M. So the first cohomology, the zeroth cohomology group, um, so this is the zeroth cohomology group, and this is the first. Homology group. The zeroth homology group is all of M, and um, so H naught of G M is just M, um, and the co-boundaries. Uh, what happens uh, with the co-boundaries if the action is trivial? Uh, well, the co-boundaries are all zero because. Uh, sigma acting on M would be just M, and since the co-boundaries are all defined as pick one M and then let sigma M minus M be the image of sigma, this image would always be zero, okay? Um, this would be for all M and for all sigma, and therefore every co-boundary is zero, okay? And what happens with the co, um, with the co-cycles? Well, phi of sigma tau, remember that the condition said that phi of sigma tau is phi of sigma plus sigma phi of tau. But if uh, sigma, if G acts trivially on M, then this action would be trivial. So there is uh, nothing there other than um, sigma of tau. And therefore phi, a cochain, is actually a homomorphism. Not twisted is a homomorphism is a hom. Okay, uh, so what that tells you is that if the action of G is trivial on M, then the uh, co chains are actually just homs, and therefore, um, what happens is then that H one, which is Z one uh, modulo. Uh, B1 is just isomorphic because B1 is trivial. That is just isomorphic to the homomorphisms from G to M. So if the action on to G on M is trivial, then H1 is just the homs uh, from G to M. Okay, very good. So let's do some computation. We're going to compute some cohomology groups just to see uh, get our hands dirty with this, with these definitions. Okay, so uh, let's do an example, a computation of an H0 and an H1. Um, so uh, let here, uh, we're going to do uh, G is going to be the Galois group. Uh, let me switch colors. Um, G is going to be the Galois group of the complex or the reals, okay? 
And um, let's see what happens if I do some H. Uh, the, well, the H naught of the Galois group of the complex over the reals acting on R cross. Um, remember that this is uh, just by definition are the invariants. So this is the invariant under G, uh, but this is already fixed by G. So this is all of R cross. Okay, so the non-zero real numbers. Um, what is then uh, H1 of the Galois group of the complex numbers over uh, R cross? Okay. Um, so first thing to notice is that um, the action is trivial. Uh, the Galois group of the complex over the reals acts trivially on R cross. So this is just Holmes. Okay, so this is just Holmes uh, from the Galois group uh, to R cross. Okay. On the other hand, uh, this is, uh, well, this is just, uh, there are two elements. There is identity and complex conjugation. Okay. And uh, if you have a home, if uh, phi G to R cross is a home, uh, well, then phi of complex conjugation has to be uh, uh, non-zero real of order two because we know that c is square is the identity so phi of c is square has to be the identity and therefore this is of order two and uh, that implies that phi of c is plus or minus one okay uh, and therefore uh h uh, h1 which is the homs from the Galois group uh, to R cross, that would be the same as the Homs from the Galois group to, uh, we see that the image has to be in plus minus one, so this is actually going into uh, plus or minus one, and this is just uh, isomorphic to Z mod two. Um, because there is exactly two. It all depends on like where the complex conjugation goes, either goes to one or goes to minus one. So this corresponds to, uh, there are just two depending on uh, where complex conjugation goes, uh, gives you one or the other. That's just a Z mod two Z, okay? So uh, what we've computed is that H1 of the Galois group of Z over R, um, on mu2, on the uh, second roots of unity, plus minus one, is the same actually that H1 of the Galois group of C over R uh, acting on all of our cross, and that is all just isomorphic to Z much to Z. So that's our first cohomology group, uh, or first first cohomology group. Uh, the Z rows is all of our cross, the first is Z much to Okay, let's do one a little bit more complicated now. So, um, so here is a bit more complicated. Um, let's start with H naught of the Galois group of the complex over the reals acting now on C cross. Again, H naught is just the uh, the G invariance. So this is C cross uh, G invariance, which we've seen by Galois theory is the uh, subfield. So this is just the units over R. Okay, so we get that. So now, what about H one of the Galois group of C? acting on C cross. Now the action is not trivial, so this is not just Holmes. Uh, we have to actually compute co-boundaries and we have to compute uh, co-cycles. So let's start with uh, the co-boundaries. 
Um, so what are the co-boundaries from G to C cross? Um, so the co-boundaries here will be maps from G by definition. They are maps from the Galois group to C cross such that uh, alpha is uh, an element and um, we just we have two generators of I mean we have one generator of G G is the cyclic of order two so I just need to know where the complex conjugation goes so let's say the C goes to alpha okay um, and uh, oops no the co-boundary remember it has a specific definition which is that um, once I pick an alpha the every co-boundary is just Sigma goes to Sigma alpha minus alpha here is multiplicative. So I'm going to uh, write it multiplicatively, which is minus is really dividing by alpha. So this is Sigma of alpha over alpha. Okay. Um, which what it all that it says is that, well, you either have the identity map and then you get exactly one. Or if you don't have the identity, then let's see what happens. Where does complex conjugation go? Complex conjugation will go to the complex conjugate of alpha over alpha, uh, which I will also denote um, by alpha bar over alpha. And that is, uh, well, it can be one if alpha is real, or uh, if alpha is A plus BI. Um, and it is not a real number, then it just goes to A minus BI, A plus BI. It also goes to that if uh, if it is a real number, it always goes there, in fact, because then A divided by A is one, okay? But that is what it's uh, co-boundary. And you see that there is one co-boundary for every alpha. Uh, so there's a lot of co-boundaries. Okay, so now um, what about, what are co-chains? All right, so what is a co-chain in this case? A co-chain will be a map. Again, a co, um, um, so what, what are the co-cycles? So the co-cycle will be a co-chain uh, like this, such that on top, we have the co-cycle condition, so the twist of home condition. So that phi of sigma tau is phi of sigma, uh, times, I'm going to write it in a multiplicative notation, uh, times sigma of phi of tau. Okay. Um, but you see here, G is, only has two elements. So there is not a lot that this can mean, um, but let's see. So let, um, let suppose that um, uh, the C, that the complex conjugation goes to B, then what does the condition tell me? The condition tells me that first of all, um, phi of C squared is the identity. So this is phi of one. Uh, phi of one has to be by the, um, the twisted home condition has to be phi of C times conjugation of phi of C. Uh, that is beta times uh, the conjugate of beta, and that is what we call the norm of beta, which would be uh, a is squared plus b is squared if um, beta is a plus bi, right? Okay, so phi of one is the norm of beta, but on the other hand, I also have that phi of one is phi of one times one because uh, one is identity, uh, and that would be phi of one times the identity acting on phi of one, which acts trivially. So this is phi of one squared. Okay. So, but if phi of one is a complex number whose square equals to itself and um, it is a unit, then phi of one has to be one. So phi of one has to be one. And on the other hand, it has to be the norm of beta. So beta has to be an element of, or of norm one. Okay, so um, what we get is that the um, the co-cycles are maps such that the complex conjugation goes to beta uh, 
phi of one is one and beta has to be a number of norm one okay so it's in the in the unit circle great um very good so now what i'm actually going to prove is that in fact Every co cycle is a co boundary. I'm going to write every co cycle one of these. So these look quite different from these, but it turns out they are the same thing. Okay, so uh, now what we're going to prove is that actually um, this equals B, that the co. Um, the co cycles equal the co boundaries. Okay. So, uh, how do we prove that? Now, suppose uh, that beta is in C cross um, such that the norm of beta is one. Okay. Uh, then I can write uh, beta um, because it's in the unit circle. If I write in polar coordinates, this is just e to the gamma phi i for some angle gamma. Uh, but notice that if, um, uh, by, by the way, one, one uh, inclusion we know, we know that boundaries are uh, co boundaries are co cycles. So I need to prove that every co cycle is a co boundary. Um, and if, um, if alpha, is an element like this, then what happens with alpha bar? Alpha bar switches the imaginary coordinates, so it actually flips the angle to a negative angle. So it goes here. And therefore, alpha bar over alpha is e to the minus two theta pi i. And remember that I, what I want um, is to write beta as some alpha bar over alpha, um, because then beta would be one of the images. Uh, this is uh, uh, sigma of alpha minus alpha. It would be a co-boundary. Okay. Um, so, but this this equation that tells me what happens with alpha bar over alpha tells me that there is actually an alpha that is minus gamma over two uh, pi i has the property uh, that alpha bar over alpha is beta. And therefore, if I have a co-boundary, uh, if I have a co-cycle that is given by phi of c is beta, um, phi of one is one, and the norm of beta is one, then uh, phi of c is also um, c of alpha over alpha uh, at co-boundary. And therefore, we've proved that um, that the co cycles are contained in the co boundaries, and we know that the co boundaries are contained in the co cycles, and therefore uh, the co cycles equal the co boundaries, and H one of G C cross is zero. It's trivial. Okay, where G here is the Galois group of C over R. Okay. All right. So it turns out that this, what we just proved, a couple of the results we just proved are um, special cases of a, of a huge theorem, which is called Hilbert's Theorem 90, you might have heard about. Um, so it turns out that we have a uh, a theorem, which is usually referred to, or at least parts of this theorem um, are called Hilbert's Theorem 90. And they say, they say the following, uh, let K be a field uh, 
then um, part A, it turns out that the H1 of the Galois group of K bar over K acting on K bar, so K bar under addition, I'm gonna put plus here just to clarify that, uh, that is trivial, uh, B, that H1, so um, of the Galois group of K bar over K acting on K bar cross, um, that is also trivial. This is the one that more often is called theorem 90. Uh, and this is what we just seen with K being the reals, the complex, the complex number being the algebraic closure and acting on the algebraic closure on C bar, on C uh, star, uh, then that was zero. So we just proved that in the very particular case of K equals R, okay? And then uh, one more is that C is that H1 is um, the Galois group of K bar over K, um, acting on M through truth unity is actually isomorphic to K cross modulo K cross to the Mth power. Um, and this is if the characteristic of K is zero or the characteristic of K does not divide M. That is, um, that's correct. Okay, we're gonna come back here and prove part C actually from part, um, from part B. Uh, once we have one more uh, one more result, which is the following, um, which is exactly what we wanted, that to say that these cohomology groups do what we wanted to do, they actually complete exact sequences of G invariants uh, like we wanted. So here is um, here is that theorem. Run out of pages. Let me add a few more pages. Okay, so um, here is uh, the theorem that we were after is the following. Uh, let uh, zero goes to P goes to m goes to n goes to zero um this is alpha and beta um, be an exact sequence of g modules um, then there is an exact sequence um, an exact, uh, long exact sequence as follows. Uh, it goes from the, the zeroth cohomology of G acting on P. Remember that, that the zeroth is just in G invariance. Um, H1, H0 of G acting on M going to H0 of G acting on N and then sneaks over uh, with a map called delta connecting homomorphism, uh, it keeps going in H1s. And in fact, it keeps going with H2s and so on, but uh, for now, uh, we just were interested in this uh, first step. Uh, where uh, delta is a map from H0 of Gn to uh, H1 of Gp, uh, which is defined as follows. So here is um, the definition uh, of delta is defined as follows. So let, um, um, let N, be uh, an element of H naught G N. Remember that is just uh, N um, invariants under G. And let 
um, let M uh, be something in M such that uh, beta of M is N. Okay, remember that beta by uh, construction or by hypothesis, beta is um, surjective. Okay, so beta is surjective, so I can I can pick such an M and define uh, a map that will be a um, a cycle from G to P, so a cycle in H one G P. Um, defined by uh, phi of sigma is sigma m minus m. Okay, then uh, phi is a co-cycle and we define delta of n to be the class of this co-cycle in the Homology class and the cohomology group of G acting on P. Okay, so this is the definition of delta. Okay, so let me uh, stop here for one little break and then I'll continue in the second video and talk about this theorem, talk and give several applications of this theorem. Um, but you see, the key is that uh, these are, um, these are. Uh, the H nodes are the invariant under G, and therefore is this is the sequence we were hoping it would be exact, but isn't. Uh, but it's what it's telling me is how to complete it with other uh, G modules, so the whole thing is exact. Okay, so uh, we'll continue in a moment. Thank you.